Hello. Um, I think everyone should hopefully be able to see this now. Apologies uh, for the delay there. Um, there was uh, some technical issues, uh, as in I don't understand how Facebook Live works very well. But I think it should hopefully be be running correctly now. Um, it looks like it on the on my app, so hopefully you can all hear me and, and see me. Um, but yes, thank you all for first of all for your patience and for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, this is the second of our our lectures that we wanted to prevent this uh, this spring to to help improve uh, cycling performance for for the the followers that we have and and our clients. So we had a, a talk with our, our friends at First Wild Scotland recently, which we'll be uh, posting the recording of shortly. So for any of you that didn't see that, we'll hopefully be able to to share that very soon. Um, but hopefully you'll all enjoy the, the talk this evening as well. This one is more specifically on bike fit, surprisingly, since it's, it's myself that's presenting it. Um, and we'll begin just by, by introducing myself, actually. So for, for those of you who I, I haven't met, I, I don't know who's watching this. This is a, a little bit unusual for me. I, I can just see my presentation, so I'm hoping people can hear. Um, but... Um, yeah, my name's Ian Finley, so I, I'm the lead bike fitter at, at Pain Free Power, which is a, a bike fitting studio based in Stockholm. Um, we've been running here since uh, June 2019, so approaching three years now that the studio has been open. Um, I've been bike fitting since 2014. Um, I've worked with slightly over 3,000 clients now with uh, a range of athletes from uh, complete beginners to uh, Olympic medalists and national champions, world champions. So a, a reasonable mixture of, of clients that we work with. Um, we work uh, in, in a very similar way, regardless of the, the individual though. So the, the process of bike fit is, is still about the, the individual and what they want to achieve from their, their cycling. So that's what we're going to be discussing a lot of today. Um, the other um, area that we wanted to discuss particularly was with regards to the IBFI. So um, I'm an accredited fitter through the International Bike Fitting Institute, um, which is uh, what should be on our next slide, I think, actually. Yeah, so we'll, we'll come through to the IBFI. Um, apologies, that was... Uh, yeah, I've got ahead of myself. So, um, yes, we'll, we'll talk about the overview. Uh, the overview of this evening. So first of all, we'll be talking about the IBFI, then describing what a bike fit is, um, then how how uh, a bike position is analysed. So our use of, of 3D motion analysis in the studio, um, a discussion of contact points and how to optimise those on a bike, and then we'll we'll open the chat to, to questions as well, because I think I can see on the left if uh, if anybody asks any questions. So hopefully those will pop up. If someone wrote something, that would be great, because then I can see that that does actually work. Um, but we'll begin by by talking about the IBFI. So the IBFI is the international governing body for for bike fitting. Um, this uh, is is designed to to try and improve the the standardization of bike fitting appointments. Uh, so if you go to any IBFI accredited fitter, there are a, a certain selection of criteria that the the appointment has to has to kind of follow as a, a general guideline. Um, thank you, Mike, for the the comment. Um, so the uh, the process with the IBFI is to try and and help to to give some. Uh, some different levels of accreditation within the industry. So similar to, to how a lot of other sport and health industries work, um, the IBFI has a, a tier system of one to four levels, um, allowing fitters to, to progress through those levels depending on experience and the, uh, the education they've undertaken and the, the equipment and technology they're working with. So it's, it's kind of a, a multi-tiered approach to, to how you progress through the levels. The uh, thing from a, a, a client's perspective is that it allows you to understand that the, the person you're going to see has, has met a certain level of criteria to, to achieve their accreditation. Um, so that's kind of what we're, we're trying to work within um, as a, an IBF higher accredited studio in, in Sweden. The, the uh, definition of a bike fit is kind of what we, we want to kind of help to, to clarify as well. So that's something that I think is badly 
understood a lot of the time. Um, that a bike fit, a lot of people just think is kind of that you'll you'll move someone's saddle up and then charge them like two thousand crowns, and then that's yeah, that's everything, and they can go. Um, but the the point of a bike fit really is to to enhance someone's riding experience. I would I would explain it as so the the position on a bike I, I think is best described in kind of a, a combination of three different aspects. So there's the the contact points on the bike itself. So with regards to the 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 parts that the, the rider's touching, so the saddle, the cleats, the cockpit, the shoes, the insoles. So those those areas are are the bits that the bike can influence with regards to a position. And I would always describe it that a bike will facilitate a good position, but it doesn't dictate a good position for a rider. So it can it can help to encourage somebody to sit well, but it can't make them do that. The other two aspects of a bike fit are also the the important areas within that. So the the cyclist needs to to be kind of strong enough and flexible enough and have enough movement control to to attain the position that they want to attain on the bike. So if they if you have somebody that's that's brand new to cycling has not done much in the way of kind of conditioning work before, um, is maybe a little bit uh, less fit than they would like to be, and also wants to ride with a, a saddle that's 20 centimeters higher than the handlebars, that's possibly going to be a challenge. Um, so it's it's about trying to work out the the mixture between what the person's capable of, uh, what they would like to do, and then getting the bike to try and facilitate those things. The third element is something where I think is is sometimes overlooked within bike fit. So it's about how to how to apply that uh, conditioning onto the bike. So just having somebody that can do a, a plank for, for 20 minutes doesn't mean anything if they don't apply those muscles whilst they're cycling. So that's something that has to be actively controlled within, within riding and making sure that the person is um, considering how they interact on the bike. So with regards to kind of the, the positioning of the hips on the saddle, with regards to the uh, posture through the back and the, the shoulders, the arms, not kind of squeezing the handlebars. And also with regards to kind of the pedaling, what they're thinking about as they ride. So we regularly ask cyclists kind of what they're, what they're thinking about as they pedal. And most of them don't necessarily have a great answer to that, if, if anything. Um, mostly it's kind of uh, regarding the scenery and the, the views, which is great. But um, some some attention to the the bike as well is is kind of useful. So that's something within a bike fit that your your appointment should uh, should consider all those factors. So there should be a, an assessment within the bike itself, an assessment to the rider, uh, and then a, a combination of making sure those things can go together. Um, the other consideration within a within a bike fit is that this should all be uh, kind of recorded and repeatable. So it should be stuff where uh, when you've had a bike fit that you you are given kind of documentation and uh, explanations on how to progress from where you are currently. So a bike position should always be developing. It's not something that's kind of you you have a bike fit and it's done. So we we have clients who we've we've seen they say like yeah i had a bike fit 20 years ago and it's it's i've had a bike fit it's done and it's it's something that that regularly changes and when people kind of stop to think about that more it's it's quite a a simple idea that the the body changes on a regular basis and people's goals change their aspirations change they may be racing and then they decide not to or they change their discipline they'll go from um within triathlon maybe short course to change into long course or they'll buy a new bike um, and the the industry changes even so with regards to to the the contact points that shoes your saddle maybe doesn't exist anymore that you used to enjoy so um all of these changes are things that need to be considered on a, a, a semi-regular basis it's things that as with all aspects of fitness that you should be seeking to try and try and improve within yourself so then that allows you to to not only ride more efficiently but generally more comfortably and enjoyably um that a bike fit does change over time um and the the appointment should should document these changes and help you to understand how to progress from where you are so the next question i thought was was good to answer was how how do you actually assess the bike position so what um what does what occurs during a bike fit to to help assess how someone is riding a bike um 
a lot of cycling is regarding uh, kinematic measures. So it's looking at um, flexion and extension angles of the, of the knee, the ankle, the hip, for example. So seeing how, how straight someone's leg is um, in easier terms. Um, and this kind of thing can be assessed in a, in a variety of ways. So the um, kind of more traditional technique was kind of using things like a, a goniometer, which is essentially a, a protractor that you can use against the joint to measure the, the angle that joint's making. Um, things like that have worked traditionally quite nicely. It gives a, a good quantification of the position, um, but it requires a, a static um, position for the rider. So the, the cyclist has to stop moving to allow that in, uh, assessment to be undertaken. The limitation with that is is largely that um, that the person moves when you when you try to stop them. So if, for example, you try to stop someone's foot through the bottom of the pedal stroke, um, quite regularly they'll kind of drop their heel as they as they do that, and then the knee is more extended at that point in time. So it's no longer the the same knee extension that they would have had as they were cycling. So um, manual techniques can still work very well, but there's there's a lot of um a lot of experience and practice to using them well it's not just as simple as uh kind of measuring an angle generally so with the the kind of the prevalence of things like smartphones and tablets and stuff now though the second aspect on the list with regards to videography becomes much more accessible for for every rider basically so most people especially in sweden with the the long winter um, have access to an indoor trainer and either a phone or a tablet or some way of, of recording themselves on the bike so with the the access to videography manual techniques become less necessary a lot of the time um, and videography has um, further advantages and it helps the person uh, understand how they're interacting on the bike so it allows them to see how they sit so if we get a video of this and play the rider through they they have a much better body awareness of how they're how they're using the space on the bike which you don't get using a a, a manual technique the person can't uh, can't visualize themselves doing that most people in their head when you kind of try to think about how you look most people have kind of like Filippo Garner and uh Remco Evenpol and things like that in their head and it's maybe a little bit ambitious for, for some riders myself included um, but videography is a great way of, of allowing first of all that uh, that visual assessment of the position but also to the, then uh, be able to freeze frame aspects of it and uh, use that to do a kinematic analysis so within this image here for example we could measure the extension of the knee between the joint centers of the knee the hip and the ankle um, and that gives us the same information as the manual technique but in a, in a more dynamic setting um, within bike fit appointments as well, there's various other tools that we try to utilize to, to give us more information to make decisions on. Um, one of the more common things that you would kind of come across within bike fit appointments are pressure mapping tools. Um, so there's uh, a company called GBMIs that we work with on this, but there are a few companies kind of providing these, these pressure mapping services now that allow the, the interaction on various contact points to be assessed in more detail. So particularly with regards to saddles, for example, so that's what we have here is a saddle pressure map. This is, a, this is an area where lots of cyclists have uh, various issues from riding, whether that's kind of chafing or uh, kind of saddle sores or numbness issues for many riders. Um, and it's an area that's very difficult to describe your interaction. So when we regularly ask people kind of what they're, what they're experiencing on the saddle, they just say it hurts. And it's, it's not enough information for us to be able to make a, a reasonable decision about what to, what to change and how to, to influence the bike position. So pressure mapping allows us to quantify the, the pressure in certain areas of the saddle, uh, allows us to see how much of the saddle someone's using, where they're sitting on the saddle, and as well how the, how the hip movement is controlled on the saddle. So we can see how stable the person is when they're riding on the bike. Um, so there's, there's a lot of information we can get from this, which is very hard to, to ascertain otherwise. Another kind of uh, more recent uh, development within BikeFit is the uh, use of um, inertial measurement units. So predominantly there's a company called uh, Leomo who is, is quite prevalent within BikeFit um, and they provide this system which we have an image of here. And these small sensors um, are much smaller than look on the image. Uh, we have mine sat behind my laptop. 
which is here. So these kind of small sensors we would uh, put onto a cyclist, which then allows us to um, measure the, the movement of a certain area. So we use these often with kind of feet and pelvic movements, uh, and they allow us to, to measure the inclination of the sensor and the, the speed it's moving at. So it allows us to look at uh, acceleration and deceleration through the movement. The useful aspect of that is it allows us to, to start quantifying uh, out of plane movements a little bit. So it allows us to look at some of the rotational and um, uh, sort of rotational and rocking kind of movements around the hips. Um, the other thing that we can do with it particularly though is it allows us to, uh, to record outside of the studio. So it allows us to... Um, to get some more ecologically valid data within a bike fit. Um, and uh, there's a question from Gustav here, which is, is asking about the the benefits of this to an individual cyclist. And I, I think systems like the OMO are, are very useful for an individual to buy as well, even. Um, it gives you a lot of information about your own movement and allows you to, to develop and progress over time. Um, this kind of thing, though, especially within a, a bike fit environment, can be very useful when we were looking at a, an individual who's sitting on the trainer in the studio for five, ten minutes. It looks comfortable and, and controlled. And then after two, three hours on the road, they're starting to get issues with their, their back or their, their shoulders or their hips. And this allows us to, to try and measure what's happening whilst they're out there without them having to sit on the trainer in the studio for hours to... to quantify that fatigue and, and progression of the position um, and it allows us as well to to gather data when the person is less uh less conscious of what's happening because one of the other elements within a bike fit is when someone's sitting on a trainer in the studio and they they know that we're watching and they know we're assessing them everyone everyone wants to look their best at that point in time so there is an element of uh people will sit better during their bike fit because they know they're being assessed um, and systems like Leomo and allowing us to take that system uh out of the studio can be a really really interesting thing to to incorporate into bike positioning um the Limitation with IMU systems, though, is that they don't allow us to measure joint kinematics so effectively. So they don't allow us to look at kind of the, the flexion and extension of a joint. Um, Leomo instead will allow us to measure the, the range of motion. So it'll allow us to see how much uh, a knee bent or extended, but it won't allow us to, to quantify what the joint angle was at a certain area. So there's always necessity to kind of still consider both aspects, both a, a kind of more data-driven internal appointment in the studio, um, and then to maybe get some outdoor data as well to, to compare with. The final kind of uh, assessment technique that we, we utilize within BikeFit are within kind of 3D motion analysis. And this is something that you'll probably have seen kind of more regularly um, recently within a lot of BikeFit systems. So there's a there's a few systems which are, um, are recording uh, three-dimensional uh, movement. Uh, so things like Retool, for example, and STT, um, BioRacer. Uh, those are kind of the, the big systems that allow some uh, some element of 3D motion to be recorded. Um, we in the studio use a system called Qualysys, which is, is less commonly used within BikeFit. Um, it's something that's generally used uh, more in a, in a research field. Um, this is the system I utilized when I did my, my master's dissertation. Uh, so that was looking at uh, validity and reliability of joint kinematics uh, in the lower limbs of cyclists. So it, it linked very nicely to BikeFit. Um, and they're a, a company based in Gothenburg, which allowed us to yeah to, to reach out when we moved over to Sweden. It, so it was a, a nice fit um, with yeah no intentional pun. Um, but the the main aspect that we use uh, Qualysis for particularly is it allows uh, rotational movement to be described much more effectively. And that's kind of what I was going to go onto this next slide is to try and explain um, how 3D motion is is recorded and and the what the what the difference in 3d motion can be as well um so most 3d systems are measuring as the the first diagram here so as a 
a single marker on a joint um, and it measures the movement of that marker within the x y and z axes so you've got your uh, uh, up down forwards back uh, left right movement within the the single marker um, but what that doesn't allow to happen is it doesn't allow rotational movement to be assessed so i've kind of grabbed a, a knee to try and help to describe this because this is a, a relatively challenging concept but very important within uh, 3d motion analysis so if we were just using a, a single marker to do a 3d tracking this marker here would allow us in in some aspect to measure kind of flexion and extension of the knee so it's on the joint center it would allow us to see kind of when the knee is bending and straightening relative to a, a marker on the hip and the ankle above and below that but if the if the knee moved in this kind of lateral direction um or if the knee rotated kind of like this the marker would move in the same direction for both of those movements and with a single marker it's very difficult to decide which of those two movements occurred whether the knee moved uh, medial-laterally or whether it rotated in that direction to be able to do that you need multiple markers around a joint um, so with the qualysis system, we're kind of utilizing uh, markers sort of above and below the knee. So we have that on the uh, bottom right in the slide. So this is kind of a marker set for a, a knee. And yeah, same on this knee we have. Uh, and that allows us to, to quantify if the, if the whole marker set moves to the side together, we can see it's a, a translational movement. And if we're seeing that the, the markers move relative to each other in that uh, local coordinate system, we can see that they, they have rotated and not translated. And within, within cycling movements, that's, a, I feel, a really important area that gets under underutilized because it's very challenging to record in some ways it, it does require um more information to be able to 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 measure these things but those rotational movements um are often ones that lead to to problems on a bike so the the kind of the more visual things are, are the flexion and extension movements like how straight is someone's knee is quite an easy thing to to visually assess um, and to to picture how that's occurring but when the knee is kind of rotating through a pedal stroke so if we have the the femur and the tibia kind of rotating away from each other through the pedal stroke it's things like that that can allow us to uh to experience kind of discomfort as well as inefficiency it's it's not a, a particularly effective way to pedal but that can be very hard to hard to record so the, the reason we wanted to utilize the quality system within BikeFit was to allow us to start analyzing a lot of these more movements for, for clients and to be able to see um, what's, what's happening within their pedal stroke with, with more detail. Um, the other side from the, the studio is that we're, we're going to be utilizing the, the quality system to, to undergo some uh, professional research projects. So it was an important uh, decision for us to be able to, to pick a system which we, we have as, as validated that we can use for those kinds of things. And quality um, was a was a very easy decision to make, given that I'd, I'd been working with it before, um, and the, uh, the the system itself is just is is fantastic for these kinds of uh, measurements. Um, this is kind of an example of kind of some of the stuff that we're we're able to do with Qualysis. Um This was one of our, our ambassadors um, that we we were working with through the the fall um, and have just recently seen again um, for a, a follow up in the spring. Um, this is looking at um, obliquity and rotational movement of the hips. So the movement of the pelvis uh, around the vertical axis and around the horizontal axis. So these kind of uh, tilting and uh, rotational movements on the saddle. And all cyclists are doing those movements to some extent, and we, we would expect that to happen. And they can be productive. They can be useful for um, preventing excessive stress on kind of sacroiliac joint, for example. But they're, they're also useful for, for helping to generate some force onto the pedal stroke. But when those movements become too excessive or uh, too asymmetric, so we can see in this example, for example, that uh, our client had a, a one hip sitting much higher up through the pedal stroke than the other. So the, the left side was kind of dropped off the side of the saddle and the left side was also quite uh, anteriorly rotated. So it kind of rolled forward. So the hips were kind of sitting rather than kind of straight and flat on the saddle. So and sitting in that direction there, you can kind of picture what I'm trying to describe in the air with my hands. Um, so these kind of movements are things that we, we do see for, for most cyclists to some extent that no one sits particularly straight and level on a bike. People aren't especially symmetrical. 
Um, but we want to start working towards improving that. And this is a good example of, of how um, how a rider can progress on a lot of these movements through uh, the work that we set them off the bike. So with regards to kind of uh, some stability and strength work, with regards to, to movement control, some uh, technique drills on the trainer, uh, and especially indoors is a very good time to work on these things because indoors the the movement is very controlled. So there's less variables that we have to be concerned about with regards to kind of traffic and weather and potholes and hills. And we can make sure that the person is is able to, to concentrate on these things safely. Um, and especially here in Sweden, we get a, a lot of time to um, to do those indoor hours. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big indoor season. So um, this was just kind of a nice example to show um, how we can utilize this class system to improve uh, a rider's uh, movement control and experience, but then also to come back to that and overlay from previous appointments to see that improvement. Because it's, it's always nice to, to be able to measure that something's gotten better for somebody. And a lot of the time when we're doing kind of more uh, sort of visual assessments with videography and things like that, we can we can try to, to explain and show somebody that something's changed. But there's a, a, a definitely a, a qualitative element to that, that it's, it's kind of trying to, to describe it and show somebody what's happened. Whereas this is, is much more uh, kind of data focused and we can we can show somebody that's moved. Um, and how we try to make those changes, obviously, within a, an appointment itself, are uh, in addition to the, the technique aspects, also with the, the bike itself, obviously, that, um, yeah, the, the name bike fit obviously precludes to, to some uh, element that uh, changes need to happen to the bike. Um, and within a bike, there's actually not that much that uh, a person's in contact with. We do largely just have kind of three contact points on the bike that are, are generally helping to, to facilitate that movement we spoke about. So the first uh, contact point is obviously with the, the pedals, where the, the shoe and the foot and the cleat are interfacing onto the pedal. We do have a, an option to, to adjust cranks as an option too. So that's going to change our, our range of motion through the pedal stroke. Um, so for kind of more aggressive positions, for example, so maybe in a, in a time trial position or a more uh, sort of aero road position, we might want to consider something like uh, a shorter crank to allow us to open the, the hips through the top of the pedal stroke because that will mean that the foot is not going to come so high through the top of the pedal stroke and that we'll be able to raise the saddle height. Um, but this is a, an area where... Um, generally bikes will come with a fairly standard size so somewhere between 170 and 175 um, and for for an average rider it's not necessarily something you have to consider um, it's something that I, I should say should be considered on an individual basis but there are there are situations where the, the standard option will be fine as well um, it's become kind of a little bit of a, a fashionable thing that everyone feels that you need to change crank length. And there is an element that crank length can be a, a positive change for some people, but it doesn't have to be changed every time. Um, it's something that you can also make a decision to keep. Um, the shoe um, and cleat interface, though, is kind of something that every appointment should be considering. Um, and shoes in themselves, I think, are kind of always the... the uh, area within cycling that are undervalued um, and uh, badly done from the industry in in short the the cycling industry seems to feel that people's feet are much narrower and pointier than they they generally are um this on the bottom left is kind of an example of a uh, uh, an outline we've done with a client so the the pen outline being the shape of the person's foot and the green outline being the the shoe and there's a, a obvious discrepancy in the the shape of those two things um and this is not uncommon um there's uh there's some brands within the cycling industry that do suit different foot shapes better but shape should be considered first rather than size um most people are concerned about like the the size of their shoe but are missing the the shape aspect first of all um and um, there's there's a lack of information generally within the bike industry about the about the shape of different shoes. So a lot of manufacturers don't give you things like the width of the shoe. Uh, some of them don't even give the length of the shoe in, in metric values that you can actually compare to your foot. Um, but trying to get good information about that, first of all, is a very important area because your foot's being compressed by the shoe. Uh, so if the shoe's too narrow, it's going to kind of compress across that transverse arch. Um, and that's going to lead to uh, a loss of function in some of the plantar muscles under the foot. So it, it can affect, obviously, force transfer into the pedal. 
but as well it's going to uh long term probably lead to to some some pain and uh and potentially even injuries within the foot um so once the once we're happy that the shoe itself is is the correct option and is, is going to uh, work well for the, the individual. Um, cleats are generally an area that's considered on a, on a bike shoe. There are clients that we work with who, who do ride in flat shoes and, and trainers, and that can be okay as well. Um, it's, a, it's a thing that's it's become kind of a, an area that people are, are told they have to to have kind of cleats and pedals and they don't necessarily um there are situations where riding without cleats and and cycling shoes can be convenient for individuals um for kind of some commuting aspects for example um and some people prefer the prefer the experience of, of riding without um and it's not it's not something that has to be done but it does allow us to uh to ensure that the position is more repeatable so when we have a, a cleat in place, we can be be confident that the rider is is putting their foot in the same place every time. Um, so it means that when we're we're seeing a movement in the studio, we can be relatively confident that we're going to have a, a comparable movement outside. Whereas if someone comes in with trainers, they could put their toe on the pedal in the studio and then put their heel on the pedal outside, and then their knee extension is going to be incredibly different between those two scenarios. Um, and we have no way of of knowing which one they've actually done uh, whilst they're outside. Um, but when we, we if we assume that we, we are considering cleats for an individual, um, there's generally kind of three predominant ways you adjust the cleat. So with regards to the, the fore and aft position of the cleat, so whether we go further forwards and backwards, um, the medial lateral positioning, so left and right, uh, and then a rotational adjustment as well. So whether we kind of twist the cleat on the shoe. Um, there's reasons to go in various directions with that. It, it does depend on a, an individual circumstance. Um, generally, the, the the kind of thought process currently is to go kind of more rearward for a lot of reasons on a bike shoe, and um, it's going to help to to reduce kind of pressure on the on those uh, branches for the nerves and blood vessels on the forefoot, uh, and to make it easier to stabilize the ankle by giving us a shorter lever from the pedal axle of the ankle joint. Um, but there there can be some benefits to going further forwards as well for individuals. So it's something that we do have to consider on a on a case by case basis. There's no universal answer to those things. Um, the medial lateral setting as well, we can utilize that to help to, to support the knee more effectively. So if someone has a, uh, a knee that's kind of rotating in towards the bike, for example, we might want to move the foot closer to that to help stabilize it a bit more with the ankle. Um, similarly, with the, the rotation on the cleat, we can use that to, to help to reduce some uh, torsional forces on the knee. So if the knee is kind of rotating in and out through the pedal stroke, um, we can sometimes use the, the float on the cleat to, to account for all of that. But if not, then we can, we can start to point the cleat to, to help alleviate some of those tensions. The other area that uh, influences the, the foot on a bike is, is obviously what happens inside the shoe. So we've considered the, the external portions of the shoe, but internally as well. Um, insoles are a, an area to, to consider within a bike position. Um, there's a, a plethora of options in terms of insoles and um, a lot of things that will tell you um, that that is the, the best answer in the world and it's the only thing that can work. And that's anything that tells you that is probably not true. Um, but the the support and interface between the, the foot and the shoe itself is, is an important area to consider. Um, again, it's something that we should consider on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, as to what the, the rider needs, if they're experiencing any discomfort, any pain, um, if, we, if we assess any kind of uh, weaknesses within the foot, any limitations to the movement of the foot, um, we can consider the, the foot support in the shoe to try and help that uh, situation. Um, various brands, so the, the picture here I think I have is a G8 insole, um, and that allows us to, along with some various other brands, to uh, to change the shape of the insole to, to help uh, be more unique to that individual. So um, considering something that you can actually adapt to your foot is, is generally something that I'd recommend because it allows us to um, be more uh, specific to you as, a, as an individual, but also allows us to uh, kind of progress and develop that shape over time. Because similarly to everything else we spoke about on the bike, the, the uh, support within the foot and the shoe doesn't necessarily need to stay the same uh, consistently for the, the whole year or uh, kind of cycling experience. As, as you develop as a rider, if you're kind of changing in weight, if you uh, get heavier, lighter, if you uh, are putting out more or less power, if you are riding for longer or shorter durations, um, those kinds of things can influence how we would, how we would want to, to work with the foot on the bike. So having an insole that allows us to do that is, is certainly an interesting thing to consider. 
Um, the other point, obviously, on a, a bike then is, is with a saddle, which is the area that um, probably the most riders have uh, issues with, I would suggest. Um, that, uh, that's definitely an area we, we uh, have to discuss a lot within the studio. Um, and it's, again, an area that's kind of very uh, filled with marketing around kind of uh, what what you should have and what you shouldn't have and uh, trying to create very black and white rules around how a saddle should work. Um, currently, there's a lot of talk about kind of the, the widths of saddles, so in terms of the absolute width from the widest point to the widest point, and there's there's obviously some relevance to that, but it's an area where I think it's sometimes overused. Um, it's it's viewed as kind of the, the only metric of a saddle that someone will measure your sit bones, you'll measure the width of the saddle, and then this is the the answer for you. Um, and it's it's unfortunately rarely as simple as that. It would be nice if, if things were that straightforward, um, but um, people tend not to be as straightforward as things like that, unfortunately. Um, one of the, the main reasons that that doesn't work for everybody is regarding the, uh, the, the tilt through the pelvis on the bike. So this is kind of a, a demonstration of how the, the interaction on a saddle uh, changes depending on uh, pelvic tilt. So when we have a more posteriorly tilted pelvic position, so we're kind of rolling the hips backwards on the bike, um, that's when kind of those sit bone measurements can be really interesting. So the sit bone is kind of this area at the back of the, the hip here. Um, and the width between those points of the, the left and the right side are particularly relevant if you're kind of sitting more, more upright and, and placed back onto those sit bones. But when we consider um, kind of, this is a particularly aggressive position on the right hand side, I'm not sure um, you would be able to pedal necessarily in that position. But um, when we kind of start to roll the pelvis more anteriorly, um, the sit bones will start to kind of, uh, sort of come higher up and almost then start to lose contact to some extent with the saddle. Um, so the, um, the width of the sit bones at that point in time becomes less of a, a concern. Um, we need to consider not only then the width of the saddle, but also the shape of the saddle. So if we're looking at kind of the shape of the, the width through the neck of the saddle, the width of the nose of the saddle, the, whether we have any channels, any cutouts, uh, whether the saddle is kind of curved through the top, whether it's a flat saddle. Um, there's, there's a lot of different characteristics of the saddle that we need to consider for an individual. Um, and this pelvic tilt is definitely something that's going to influence that along with those kind of more anthropometric measures of, of sit bone width, for example. So on its own, it doesn't tell us nearly enough for most cyclists. Um, this is kind of a, a demonstration of, oh, that's a stem. Uh, this is a demonstration of how that, uh, how that pelvic tilt influences a, a seating position. So it's a very uh, exaggerated examples of very posterior and anterior tilt. Um, but as we kind of start to roll the pelvis more anteriorly and start to kind of lower down through the torso, we're going to start to head more towards that right side of the image with the, the more anteriorly tilted sit bone positions. And the, the width of the saddle then at the back becomes less of a, a relevant factor. The the saddle itself, obviously, we don't need to consider the, the positioning of, so the, the height, the setback, the angle, uh, the three general considerations of, of where you position a saddle. Um, and those are things that are then going to be dictated by some of the kinematic measures that we looked at earlier on. So with regards to uh, the, the stability in the pelvis, the knee extension, the ankle flexion, and, and how the, the hip, the knee, and the ankle are interacting through the pedal stroke is going to help us to assess whether the saddle's in the right position. Because regularly, uh, when people have issues with saddles, it's not necessarily the saddle itself, but more how the saddle is being set up that lead to the, the, the problems. So the combination of the right saddle in the right place is when things will start to become a, a more pleasant riding experience. Cockpits, um, obviously, is kind of the, the, the last contact point on the bike and is an area that, depending on the, the style of bike, is obviously the most variable. So... If you have a, a mountain bike position, for example, you're going to have a, a very different uh, shoulder and arm position to if you're riding on a, on a TT tempo bike. Um, those kinds of things are going to vary a lot between bikes. Um, and as well, there's a lot more uh, kind of proprietary and integrated options on bikes now than, than there has been previously. Um, and that sometimes limits the, the possibility for adjustment. 
Um, traditionally, we would have had things like this. Uh, it's kind of a standard stem that we have on the right hand side. Uh, and then we could pick stems based on different lengths and angles to allow us to have a, a higher handlebar position, a lower handlebar position, more forwards, more rearward. And we could use that to influence the uh, shoulder extension and, and elbow flexion on the bike. And those things are uh, it's still adjustable on a lot of bikes, but um, generally a lot of bikes now, like I say, are becoming more uh, more limited in that regard that the, the manufacturers are aiming to kind of keep you on brand with their specific uh, components uh, and don't necessarily have as much adjustability as we, we previously have had. Um, Moving on from the stem, there's obviously then the, the handlebars, which vary depending on whether it's a, a road bike position or a mountain bike, like we said, or uh, on a TT bike, where we have kind of more of the, the extension and armrest position. Um, with a, a drop bar on a road bike, um, it's something that can be used to, to further influence some of this, uh, the, the distance of the handlebars. So the reach of a handlebar is an area that we, we regularly use to try and uh, try and adjust the position, especially if we're already considering to change the width of the handlebar for someone. If we can increase or decrease the reach at the same time, we maybe don't need to actually change the stem and we can make both the, uh, the, the width and reach changes within one component. Um, that's an area that I think is regularly undervalued with handlebars, that you can actually pick bars that are shorter or longer. Um, we, we've had a reasonable number of cases where someone's uh, changed bars to get a different width, but decided to go for like a, a nice arrow option as well with kind of a flat bar, and uh, they've ended up increasing the reach on their bike by a couple of centimeters uh, inadvertently, and suddenly um, everything becomes a lot less comfortable. Um, the cockpit on a, a TT bike is, a, is an area that has um, actually sometimes more adjustability than on a road bike, where we can uh, change things more within the component itself. So with regards to uh, the, the reach, for example, we often are able to move the arm pads and the extensions further forwards and backwards on the position without actually having to change a component. We can just move it on the bike. Um, and similarly, the, the height of the position, so the, the stack, we can sometimes raise that up uh, by using kind of these spaces between the, the base bar and the, the extension and armrest themselves. So those changes, um, depending on the, the component manufacturer and what the bike came with, um, are things that, uh, that can sometimes actually be easier to change in some ways because we don't need to change components but there's also then more variability so there's more uh more potentially bad options that can be set up because there's more potentially good options the the total number of choices are, are greater so the, the chances of something being less well set up are, are probably higher at the same time um the other thing we regularly see with with cockpit positions are that people are considering those far too uh, far too soon. That we see people that are, are sitting very badly and pedaling very badly, but they're very concerned about how the how the cockpit's set up, and they're trying to get kind of these more angled arm positions and getting their shoulders really narrow, and and all of that's great. But if you're not sitting and pedaling, then it doesn't really matter. So you need to be able to to apply propulsion to the pedals first before we're considering the the arm and seating position, because those parts at the back of the bike um, are going to be set up if we go all the way back through relative to that bottom bracket position. So that bottom bracket position is our, our fixed part on a, a bike that we can't move the, the center of rotation here. So we need to consider things uh, moving outwardly from there. So from the, the bottom bracket to the cranks, to the shoes, to the cleats, to the saddle, to the handlebars. So if we're starting at the handlebars, probably something's gone badly wrong in between, basically. Um, so those those considerations are kind of our, our final elements of a bike position not the not the place to begin um then once we've actually got this position set up if we think back to that kind of venn diagram we had earlier on we then need to make sure that the the technique of the rider uses those contact points effectively so once the bike is in a position that it's it allows a person to move effectively it's then up to them to become uh kind of to, to make sure that their conditioning uh is maintained that they don't become uh stiffer or weaker uh and that they apply a technique that allows them to use those things effectively and a bike fit should ensure that the person understands uh, their requirements within a bike position 
and that it's a, it's a conversation between the fitter and the individual to ensure that the position that we're we're deciding upon is is attainable for their aspirations. If they don't want to do lots of work, we can't set a particularly aggressive position necessarily that would require them to do lots of training. So that's something that right at the start of a fit needs to be uh, needs to be discussed between a, a fitter and a, a client to decide uh, what the what the desires are from that bike position and how much will the the, the individual want to go and, and focus on these elements of, of technique and positioning and and conditioning and strength and mobility um, and how much of it would they just like to ride the bike um, and those are things that really should influence a bike fit and need to be considered right at the start so probably a very bad time to mention that as my very last point but um, yeah that's kind of everything that I had to to um explain within a, a bike fit so i was wondering now i guess there might be some questions um because i'm a little bit new with the facebook live so let's see if anything's there um oh, i disappeared hopefully i'm back um so So a question from Leo. In recent years, many TT riders have adopted a position with both the armrests and the hands higher up. Give a higher handle power position, can it be a benefit to also change the saddle for the backwards to achieve a longer, more aerobic position? Um, yeah, that's something that we we consider with quite a few of our riders. So um, particularly within uh, kind of the time trial with the UCI regulations of being especially limiting to uh, to maybe taller riders where we want to get more room to lengthen the torso onto on the bike. Um, and we can't go any further forwards due to the the limitations to the, the UCI position. Uh, trying to get the, the hips more rearwards from a, an aero perspective can definitely be quite useful because it allows us to get a flatter torso position, allows us to uh, have a more open shoulder position, um, and that can can reduce frontal area and allow a, a more smooth airflow over the back. But the, the challenges there are that then is going to lead to a a more closed hip position. So um, it can be more difficult with regards to uh, the the pedaling element of, of riding the bike, which is fairly crucial still. Um, and we'd see some reductions in power. So it's it's a an element of, of weighing those things up on an individual basis. Um, obviously, things like cranks can then start to be considered uh, more seriously as well, because if we if we sit someone's hips further backwards and uh, we close their hip off, we can then maybe shorten the crank and then allow more open hip positions so we can start to get to these kind of uh, more aerodynamic positions without negatively affecting the, the kinematics of the position. Um, but it's it's definitely one of those that has to be considered on a case by case basis. So more often than not, we see cyclists maybe aren't as strong in their their hip flexors as they should be to ride in an aggressive time trial position, uh, and we start to see a lot of kind of rotational movements on the hip on the saddle and with the knees going uh, sort of out from the bike. That is the kind of visual aspect to that, and. Um, adjusting the bike can definitely help on that but also um the the work off the bike is a is a crucial factor to um to trying to improve the the pedaling output on the bike um so i think that maybe answered your question hopefully uh, i think i went off a bit of a tangent but um uh, let's see what else we've got uh, so joshua uh, what should take on wedging to stabilize the feet within the shoes along with a good insole um so wedging uh so is the the use of kind of uh, uh blocks and uh tilts either underneath a cleat or inside the sole to kind of provide a, a tilt to the to the foot within the shoe um or externally to the shoe underneath the cleat say um and it's a it's an area that we we do utilize within some fits it's it's something that um, insoles can help us to to work with as well. So it's it's not necessarily something that I I use all the time within bike fits. Definitely, um, it's uh, it's it's something where it it can be useful on a, an individual basis. Um, 
and often kind of the, the the sensation i think people um when they've they've been used to that within a shoe can kind of like but it's an area as well that we do uh, regularly see where they've been kind of put in during kind of previous appointments maybe in, in, a, in another bike fit and the um when we remove them, we see very little change in kind of the the interaction on the bike. So if we're looking at kind of the, the pressure within the insoles, uh, under the shoes, uh, and the, the kinematics of the pedal movement, it's, it's something that we don't necessarily see having a, a large effect sometimes. Um, it can do for certain individuals, but I feel it's something that we need to be able to, to quantify a, a, a worthwhile improvement to the position when we make a change. And that's one of those areas where... Um, it's, it's certainly good to try that with an individual and see whether we do see a, a positive outcome. But if we can't, uh, if we can't quantify that something beneficial has changed due to, to making a change on a bike, um, I would always question whether we should be making that change. Um, we should be able to, to quantify some positive outcome from having made a change. Um, but uh, hopefully that's, answered on that one joshua but yeah wedging and, and cleats and uh stacks is definitely something we can have um a lot more discussions about for sure um to be yes. so is there a difference between fitting done in the studio stockholm and when you do traveling um yes probably um the the process is the same definitely um so the um the, the general procedure we're still going through the same uh steps that we're still going through like the same considerations with with finding the uh, desires of the rider finding out their their current capacity with regards to their strength and mobility um and making the similar alterations on the bike um often uh we're having to make um more recordings during a, a trip because we have uh, generally just one camera with us so we have a single uh, 2d camera from the side so um for individuals where we're having uh, particular issues with regards to maybe the back or the hips um i would say that uh being able to use the closest uh, system in the in the studio is definitely uh a, a preferable thing for us to do um and that's something that we can't really we travel with. Um, it's a system that's kind of bolted to the walls. I think you can kind of see it over my shoulders. There's kind of one on the wall there, and a couple sort of over that side. Um, so it's yeah, it's not something that we can necessarily um, take with us, obviously. But uh, for the, the the general bike fit, uh, the outcomes for a lot of individuals will be similar. Um, it's very hard to say without um, as a as a overall kind of view because it, it is yeah as my answers are for everything it seems this evening very individual um but um the there is differences between when we travel and when we we do in the studio but we try to minimize them as much as possible thank you very much mike that will be yeah hopefully you're you're doing well and i'll look forward to seeing you when you're you're back on your feet Um, bike fits in the UK. Um, good question, Richard. Um, currently no plans at the moment. Um, the, the, the studio here is currently, um, busy. So we, we don't actually have time with traveling to the UK at the moment. Um, definitely would be, uh, something we could discuss though. So yeah, drop me a message and we'll, um, we can, we can have a talk about it. I um, hope you're doing well with your riding as well. I'll look forward to hearing when we, we chat if you've got any trips planned. Um, okay. Any more questions or are we... I'll give it just a second because I think there's a bit of a delay. Ah, yes, here we go. So, do you do any air optimization during bike fitting? Um, yes, definitely. It depends on the um, requirements of the rider. So, if it's someone um, that wants to ride a, a city bike to commute to work, then probably not so relevant. But um, for for TT and uh, triathlon positions, definitely something we should consider 
um, in, in all of those setups. Um, not even necessarily if someone is, is considering that they want to go faster always. So with uh, some of those uh, kind of longer durations, it's it's about making sure that they're as efficient as they can be on the bike as well. So if you can use less energy while you're riding to generate the same velocity, um, the, the run off the bike, for example, is going to be better. But um, yeah, we do do a lot of area optimization work. Um, we have kind of a bi race of virtual wind tunnel in the studio that we can use to do frontal area projections. And then we've been uh, utilizing some uh, some outdoor area testing as well that we can use to uh, give us some, some real world data on, on CDA. Um, so yeah, definitely something that uh, we, we enjoy working with. We've done that with, uh, with a lot of clients. So, again, I'll give it another little minute just in case, because like I say, there's a think a bit of a delay from what I'm saying and what you're typing. Well, I think that's by the look of it, everything. So. Um, if anyone thinks of any questions that they, they wanted to ask or they don't want to put in the chat, do feel free to to send them across to us as well. So you can send us a message. Um, I guess you all have Facebook because this is Facebook Live. So you can uh, drop us a message on our uh, Facebook page or you can send us an email. Um, and uh, yeah, if you think of anything you meant to uh, meant to ask that you you didn't think of at the time, yeah, please just get in touch. But thank you all very much for your for your time and for, for joining us and thank you for your patience as well at the beginning um yeah apologies it was all a little bit delayed um but i think it hopefully worked out okay in the end so yeah thank you all very much have a great weekend <laughs>